Let's start with that incredible game from South Bend. Notre Dame looks like they've got the win, and then Ohio State, they stole it from them. McCord in the shotgun. Train him off his right hip. Two wide to the right. Snap McCord. Hands to train him. Straight in. Yeah. End zone. Touchdown, Chip. Train him. For the second straight week. Bogey. The converted linebacker finds the end zone, and that'll win it for Ohio State. What a football game that was. What an incredible college football game that was. Every time that this happens, I, I invite us all, before we start reacting and heaping on hyperbole to either the winner or the loser, right, and reacting too far, let's, let's first take a moment to enjoy what we saw, which was an incredible college football game, an incredible college football environment. That's everything that the sport should be right there. Two in, like really good football teams, really good football teams, standing toe-to-toe, -to -toe, right in the middle of the ring, trading blows the entire night. It was fabulous. It was absolutely fabulous. And, and truth be told, I was in an airplane, had TV, thankfully, uh, flying home. And at one point, like late, it was during one of those really dominant drives from Notre Dame in the second half, the TVs went out. And I was one of those guys, you know, that are like, oh, geez, like, what are we doing here? We can't watch TV 32,000 feet in the air. Come on. That was me. The Louis C.K. Like, like that was me. I'm in a tube 32,000 feet in the air mad because I can't watch live television because I was enthralled with this football game. It was that good. I loved everything about it. I loved the fact that the players were all making plays on every side of the ball. Special teams were, were good. No one was making the giant mistake, right? This wasn't a, a lot of times these big college football games, they can be uh, riddled with mistakes and penalties and turnovers and special teams gaffes. And a lot of times in games like this, it's about the teams that lose the game rather than the team that went out and won the game. I didn't necessarily feel that about this one. This one was well played, even with a young quarterback at Ohio State making his fourth start in Kyle McCord. And certainly the experienced quarterback, Sam Hartman, he played fantastic. Both offensive lines at times were really good. Uh, they struggled at times as well. Again, like everybody was making plays. Plays. This is the type of game that we have to appreciate, at least for a moment, before we start to react. Because in college football, everything is about the reaction. You and I both know that we immediately want to know what this means for our team long term. What does this mean for the Buckeyes long term? What does this mean for the Buckeyes in the Big Ten and versus Penn State and against Michigan? If I'm an Irish fan, what does this mean for Notre Dame's playoff chances? What does this mean for their teams that they're going to face later in the season and USC's coming to town? And we're always forward looking. And at some points, we've got to take a Nick Saban line, even as fans, and be where our feet are and where our feet were on Saturday was witnessing a fantastic game. I loved everything about it. I wanted to start there because that's where we should start. We don't need to start with the, the, the Ryan day sound after the game or the mistakes that maybe were made from the coaching staff with Notre Dame. There'll be time for that. And I will get into that. There's no doubt. And, and all of that deserves at least some evaluation and analysis. And I'll give it to you. But I, I wanted to start with just an appreciation for the quality of game that we witnessed because I thought it was remarkable. It was just a really great game to witness and to watch. I loved it. I really did. So then you start thinking about like these two teams and these two teams what are my conclusions and, and what are my feelings for these two teams now versus what they were when I woke up Saturday morning before the game? And candidly, and this doesn't always happen, and I think that this speaks to the level of game that it was, I feel more confident in both teams moving forward. There's only a handful of times that's ever happened in my entire career covering this sport, and, and this Saturday was now one of them. I feel more confident in both teams. I had questions for both programs and teams and, and certain sides of the ball and players specifically coming into the day, and I, I legitimately feel like both of these teams are better than I thought after the game. 
And so even in a loss for Notre Dame, I just don't think that the season's over I, I at all. I think that they've got a lot on their schedule. Now, this doesn't help, I'm not, but they've got a lot on their schedule. The type of game that it was and the way that they lost, I think can be not necessarily explained away, but at least there's an argument about how great the environment was and what happened at the end. If you're Notre Dame, I still think there's a lot in front of you. That quarterback, Sam Hardman, makes them a totally different program. I, I, was, I was hoping this before the game, and it was certainly uh, solidified during and then now after the game, is that I thought that Sam Hartman raised the ceiling for Notre Dame. I said before last week on this show, I said if they were to win this game, it would have been their biggest win really in 30 years because it would have made them legitimate at the top, legitimate in terms of a national championship. And even in a loss, I kind of feel that way. I talk constantly about above the line and below the line teams, and we're going to have a, a, a much more uh, thorough conversation about that specific line on Wednesday with a lot of teams throughout the country. Who's above, who's below the line. Even with a loss, I still feel like Notre Dame is an above-the-line team. The way that that game played out, the way that their quarterback played and their offensive line played and their defense played at times, in particular in short yardage situations, like Notre Dame is still really good. They're still really good. And the way that the top end of college football has come back to the pack a little bit, you can't tell me that there's a team out there that you wouldn't be at least somewhat confident that Notre Dame could beat. They almost beat Ohio State, and I think Ohio State is, is a really good team. That, that's a tough out, Notre Dame. USC's got some problems after Saturday. The way I feel about USC's trip out to South Bend later in the season, after what I saw on Saturday, both from the Trojans and the Irish, makes me completely rethink that game in October. And guess what? USC's going to have some problems at Notre Dame because Notre Dame is totally legitimate. Before I get into the end for Notre Dame, let's take a quick peek then at Ohio State. Because Ohio State was a little bit of a different feeling, okay, coming into this one. I think there was more anxiety for Ohio State because the expectation at Ohio State is to compete for a national championship. Where at Notre Dame, I felt like there was a hope that maybe we are on the level, if you would, above the line, could we compete for a national championship? Whereas it's different in Columbus. The expectation is that it's not a hope. It's a standard. And there's been a lot of chatter about Ryan Day and Ohio State all season long. I've touched on it a little bit. You know, some others have. And, and I made an observation about the way that the national media at least talks to uh, about Ohio State and even maybe more so some of their fan base. And I said, hey, what would our narrative be surrounding that program if they had been the team last week that was in a 10-10 tie with Wyoming in the shoe in the fourth quarter? Because that's what happened with Texas. And we didn't really talk about it with Texas. You know, it was kind of like, yeah, 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 you know, but Texas beat Alabama, so like all is good. And, you know, that's that's not the way that we view Ohio State. Their standard is so high. And so coming into Saturday's game, there was some anxiousness, anxiety, I think is the better way to put it, about how they would play. Um, I say McCord's fourth start because – I don't really count his first, um, which was basically in spot duty as a freshman when C.J. Stroud needed to sit the week after the Oregon game two years ago. Like, that's not, like, to me, uh, that's not a start. That was, like, that was a scrimmage a long time ago. This is this is starting now. And, and so here's this new starter in Kyle McCord. Here's an offensive line that they're trying to rebuild in, in, in some uh, respects. And 
you know, they hadn't been great in the first week, in particular running the ball in short yardage. And there's this narrative, there's this lingering effect from what happened in the big house two years ago and the way that Michigan has run the ball, in particular in the fourth quarter against Ohio State over the last two years. There's this narrative of the defense and what the defense wasn't able to do late against Georgia. And we'll get into like how Ryan Day reacted to it. But here's the thing is like during the game, you saw all of that creep up. And I'm watching that game and I'm thinking to myself, it's happening all over again. Notre Dame is using the Michigan blueprint. Those two series in the second half, really the fourth quarter, you know, those two second half drives where they just hammered away with the run game and Ohio State could just not quite get off the field. I thought to myself like, oh boy, this, this is not good. For Buckeye fans, this is not good for Ryan Day. This is not good for that defense. Like you thought to yourself, like this, this is the narrative coming to fruition. Here it is. Notre Dame is beating them at the line of scrimmage. They can't get to Hartman. They can't stop the run. They can't run the ball on short yardage. It's happening. That's the way the game was playing out. That's the way the game was playing out. And then all of a sudden, Kyle McCord walks onto the field with a minute 26 left and goes down the field and scores in a remarkable drive, a remarkable drive. When he walked onto the field, I just didn't, I didn't believe that it was going to happen that way. I really didn't. Marvin Harrison is is struggling a bit on a bum ankle. Unfortunately, he hurt that one uh, earlier in the game. And, and McCord stands in there and makes giant throw after giant throw. And by the way, what I loved most about it was that he was just taking what the defense was giving him. can take that underneath the safety and he throws it on time and he takes it the fourth down he throws it short of the chains Fleming is able to get the line to gain he throws it to Harrison in the pocket Harrison stretches out Kyle McCord didn't do anything heroic on the last series he just made the throws that the de defense dictated which is exactly what we talked about on the program last week which was incredible, but you, do, you, do you understand the courage that it takes to do that? That is, it's the equivalent of the Braveheart scene when William Wallace is sitting there and they're, they're holding while the cavalry is running at him. Hold, hold. It is so difficult to stand in there in crucial moments in games and feel like you've got to get it all back. The clock is ticking down. The narrative is coming true. Our whole season is on the line. And he just calmly made the throws that were presented to him. That takes an immense amount of courage and experience, by the way, and he doesn't have experience. So I come out of this game and I'm like, wow, Ohio State has a guy at quarterback. You don't make that drive unless you are a guy. That's just a bottom line. You do not accident your way down the field in a game like that in the last minute 26. It does not happen. There are guys and there are series and there are two minute situations that do happen by accident. And all of a sudden there's a blown coverage and there's a huge play or something presents itself. Trust me, it's happened for me before out there. Granted a lifetime ago, but like it's, it's happened. It happened against Kansas state in 2004 to me. All of a sudden they, but they bust a coverage. Ron Monte runs right down the sideline. He's wide open. We hit him. We win the game. This, this was not that. This was not an accident. It was not a blown coverage. Kyle McCord went out there and was just a guy. Like, And by the way, in the best sense of the word, because J-A-G, Jag, like, he's not just a guy. Like, he's a dude. He's a dude, man. And now you view Ohio State totally different. 
totally different. They Now you can say like, well, they were able to get the fourth down stops. <laughs> and man, their defense kind of hung in there. And man, it's just like, this is, this is why it was such a great game. This is why it was such a great game is because if it, if it ends one way, the, it's a totally different shift in the way that we feel about a team, the way that we are talking about a team in Ohio State. And because it didn't end that way and it ends with their win, I feel totally different. I feel totally different. Okay, now let's get into some specifics. And I don't normally do this on, on this program. I like to talk, talk bigger picture uh, with you, the fans. But this is this is too much a part of the story about what happened late. So we do have to talk about what happened late because after everything that I just said about the these two teams, and I believe everything that I just said, hard not to come away from that game thinking to yourself, boy, the Notre Dame coaches really did a disservice to their players. And I say that with a lot of caution because it's going to sound personal and it's not. It's not. I think Marcus Freeman has done a heck of a job at Notre Dame. That team is better than what they they ever were under Brian Kelly. That team's ceiling and athleticism and physical nature at the line of scrimmage, that team is at a higher level than they ever were under Brian Kelly. So this is not a knock on Marcus Freeman, but... When you play and coach in those moments, you cannot make big mistakes. And they made a couple of very big mistakes from a coaching standpoint that really caused their team to lose or at least allowed their team to lose. I think you guys know where I'm going with this, right? Uh, the minute 26 left, Ohio State still has a timeout to go out there and, and execute that drive, which they needed because of the intentional grounding. Which, by the way, I totally disagree with, but neither here nor there, which they needed. We got to go back to now after Notre Dame has has totally really owned the line of scrimmage for a couple of series late in the game. They get the ball with a little over four minutes after Ohio State can't convert the fourth down. Ohio State has taken a timeout before that fourth down. And and here we are, like Notre Dame can end the game. Texas ended the game on the field against Alabama because they were able to impose their will with the run game. And I thought to myself, like, this is it. This is when Marcus Freeman says, all right, big guys up front, you've owned the second half, now go end the game. And I'm like, okay. And what do they do? Two first down plays right away in the first two snaps. Boom, first down. Boom, first down. And I'm like, okay, they're going to end the game on the field. They're going to end the game on the field. And then all of a sudden it unravels and it unravels quickly. And this is what coaches in particular young coaches don't realize about those moments. They don't take a lot of time. You've got to be ready before this happens. And here's how it happens. All of a sudden you get thrown into the blender. How do you get thrown into the blender? Because all of a sudden on a nondescript first down play, JT Tuimolo Al blows it up. And now you're way behind the chains and it's second and forever. And now it's like, well, what do you do? Well, now it's not just like base four minute offense. Okay, let's get in there and just run it. You've got to have a plan for that moment. And if you've never been in that moment, it can take you by surprise. And I believe that it took them by surprise. Some will disagree with me on this. I believe strongly you cannot run the screen pass on second down. Ohio State has just taken their second timeout. You have got to drain those timeouts. He is he is alerting you that I'm about to drain my timeouts just to have a chance. Just to have a chance. So at that moment, after the first down play, Tui Moloal blows it up. Ohio State takes their first timeout. Or excuse me, their second timeout. They've got one left. If you do the math, then in your mind as a play caller, you've got to be thinking to yourself, worst case scenario, I'm giving the ball back to Ohio State with about a minute 25, a minute 20 left, and they will have no timeouts. They will have no timeouts. 
That's 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 a 40 second mistake throwing a screen pass on second down and it becoming incomplete. Now Ohio State can save the timeout and choose whether they want to use it after third down or not and save it for their offensive possession. And now they've got the minute 20 to a minute 26 and they will have a timeout. That's a massive mistake from the coaching staff. That cannot be a play that can end in an incompletion. It just can't. I like you can tell me all you want that it's like, no, they've got to be aggressive. You got to go out there. Not at second and forever. I just don't believe that you're going to get the first down at that moment. At that moment, you've got to be resigned to the fact that you're probably going to punt. So your main objective is time. And it comes in 40 second chuck chunks. A timeout equals 40 seconds. So you've got to eliminate those 40-second chunks, as many of them as you can, before they touch the ball. Throwing an incomplete pass on second down, by the way, almost picked off. Can you imagine if he would have done that? My goodness. I thought that was a massive mistake. And then we get to the end. And we get to the end, and you talk about being in a blender. Abuka catches the ball at the one-yard line. Ohio State races up and spikes the ball with seven seconds left. They are out of timeouts. They line up for the second down play. Timeout Notre Dame. Timeout Notre Dame. Out of a timeout, they play two snaps with 10 players on the field. What are we doing? So your players played that hard for 59 minutes and 53 seconds. And 10 players played the last seven seconds. That cannot happen. It can't happen. It can't happen for Jones Junior High School. It can't happen for modern day down the road right here, one of the best high schools. It can't happen for Mount Union in Division Three. It can't happen for the uh, JUCO. It can't happen for Group of Five. And it certainly cannot happen with 10 million people watching in the biggest game of the college football day between Ohio State and Notre Dame. That cannot happen, period, period. I'm sick for them that it happened that way.